Guillain-Barre syndrome is an acute inflammatory polyneuropathy, often occurring after an episode of gastroenteritis or respiratory tract infection. It is thought to be an autoimmune condition in which antibodies lead to an immune attack on the myelin of peripheral nerves or the axons of peripheral nerves. In most cases, this involves both motor and sensory nerves and can also affect autonomic nerves as well. These antibodies are mostly targeting gangliosides, which are molecules made up of lipids and carbohydrates found particularly in the cell membranes of nerves. Examples of these antibodies include anti-GM1, GD1A and GD1B. The exact mechanism is not clear, but may be due to molecular mimicry, where antibodies are generated against a particular antigen, possibly from a microbe, that then also cross-reacts with the gangliosides. Compilobacter jejuni bacterial capsular lipooligosaccharides, for example, are thought to generate antibodies that cross-react with myelin. This results in damage to the myelin, the Schwann cells that produce the myelin, or the axon itself, meaning that nerve signals are no longer able to be transmitted along the nerve as effectively. There are multiple subtypes of Guillain-Barré syndrome, based on those which cause demyelination, those which affect the axons, and the symptoms produced as a result. An example of demyelinating is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, AIDP, which is the most common subtype, making up 80 to 90% of cases. There is segmental loss of myelin. Often, when the immune response is stopped, remyelination occurs and symptoms can resolve. Acute motor axonal neuropathy, or AMAN, which is more common in Japan and China, is an example where the axon is targeted in mostly larger motor neurons, with minimal loss of myelin. Symptoms can vary based on the subtype. For example, AIDP involves both motor and sensory symptoms, while AMAN does not have any sensory loss and instead mostly features motor weakness. The main range of clinical features in AIDP include weakness, their typical presentation features a progressive symmetrical weakness, termed ascending, meaning it begins in the distal and moves proximally, typically beginning with the legs. This process is rapid and progresses over days, leading to flaccid paralysis, meaning paralysis with reduced muscle tone, as opposed to spastic paralysis where tone is increased. Most cases reach maximum severity within two weeks and progression of weakness beyond four weeks is more consistent with a chronic demyelinating process. Following this stage is a plateau, usually lasting several weeks, before symptoms begin to resolve. The facial muscles can also be affected, and this is the most common cause of acute flaccid paralysis in children. Commonly, there is paresthesia affecting the hands and feet, alongside the weakness, although usually starting before it. Pain is also a common symptom, which is mostly in the back and legs, and particularly in children. Again, this may precede the motor weakness. Between 20 and 30% of patients will also develop respiratory distress as a result of involvement of the respiratory muscles, requiring ventilation. The majority of cases will have absent or minimal reflexes, primarily affecting the ankle and knee, although rarely hyperreflexia can also occur. Other possible manifestations include speech slurring, dysphagia meaning difficulty swallowing, diplopia meaning double vision, and dysautonomia where there is involvement of the autonomic nervous system giving sinus tachycardia, hypertension, and postural hypotension. Features of the other subtypes include Miller-Fisher syndrome characterized by ophthalmoplegia, areflexia, and ataxia, and Bickerstaff's brainstem encephalitis, which is similar to Miller-Fisher, but also includes altered consciousness and can feature hyperreflexia, 
AMSAN, or acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy, also includes axonal loss of sensory nerves, and acute pan dysautonomia, presenting with autonomic features like diarrhea, ileus, vomiting, abdominal pain, and urinary retention, as well as disturbance in heart rate and blood pressure. Another type is pure sensory, characterized by acute sensory loss and sensory ataxia, and pharyngeal cervical brachial type, featuring acute arm weakness, swallowing dysfunction, and facial weakness. Two out of three cases occur within six weeks of an infection, most commonly after an episode of gastroenteritis or an upper respiratory tract infection. The most commonly identified infectious triggers include Campylobacter jejuni in up to 39% of cases, Cytomegalovirus in up to 22, Epstein-Barr virus in up to 13, and Mycoplasma pneumoniae in around 5%. There have also been cases associated with COVID and Zika virus. Overall, Guillain-Barré syndrome is slightly more common in males and females, estimated to be around 1.78 to 1, with a mean age of onset of 40 years. As part of the diagnosis, nerve conduction studies and electromyography are performed to confirm the presence of a peripheral neuropathy, and analysis of the cerebrospinal fluid is also valuable. The classic finding being an elevated protein level with a normal cell count, called albuminocytological dissociation. This can take time to develop, and 1 in 10 cases never develop this finding. CSF analysis is also important in ruling out other infectious causes. Bloods can be taken looking for particular anti-gangliocide antibodies, but a negative result doesn't rule out Guillain-Barré syndrome. Culturing or serology for the specific triggering infection is not routinely done in clinical practice, and bedside spirometry is done regularly, typically every six hours, due to the potential for rapid progression and involvement of the respiratory muscles. The risk of this is nearly 18-fold with bulbar dysfunction, and nine times with the inability to cough, and is also associated with the inability to lift the head from the pillow. Calculators like the Erasmus Guillain-Barré syndrome respiratory insufficiency score can help predict the likelihood based on presence of multiple risk factors. Treatment involves a combination of supportive care with disease-modifying medication, with a multidisciplinary approach including rehabilitation. Supportive care can involve mechanical ventilation, as we mentioned, and blood pressure as well as cardiac monitoring is usually done in cases of dysautonomia. Episodes of hypotension can be treated with IV fluid boluses, while hypertensive episodes may be treated with short-acting agents like labetalol or nitroprusside. And DVT prophylaxis is also given as there is prolonged immobility and the medication given can also increase the risk. Pain also needs to be controlled, and agents like carbamazepine, amitriptyline, or gabapentin can be useful in neuropathic pain, and application of heat can also be relieving. It is recommended to have passive joint movement from the onset, and immobilization is not recommended. Disease-modifying medication focus on immunotherapy with intravenous immunoglobulins or plasma exchange being the main two options. Intravenous immunoglobulins are more commonly used as plasma exchange needs a central line. Corticosteroids have not been found to be beneficial and may actually worsen outcomes.